So just before the break, we heard stories about the long-term unemployed, the cover story in the latest edition of Bloomberg Business Week. So how do we really jumpstart the U.S. jobs engine? Are unemployment benefits a part of the equation? Are they helping or hurting things? In today's Reganomics, we're debating whether we're scaling back unemployment benefits too soon or not soon enough. Joining me right now is Professor Bill Rogers, Rutgers University economics professor and former chief economist with the U.S. Department of Labor. He says, but we can't scale back benefits because we aren't creating any jobs. And from Washington, D.C., Cato Institute senior fellow Daniel Mitchell, he thinks keeping the benefits coming keeps people on the couch and out of the workforce, thereby keeping unemployment high. Welcome to both of you. Professor Rogers, starting off first with you, make the case for me on why we should be increasing from current levels, which many would argue are already uh, pretty significant, the unemployment benefits we're seeing. Well, I guess first I want to be clear. I'm not saying increasing. I, my stance has been the uh, Congress's recent scaling back on the extended benefits duration, mm -hmm. that that's probably premature. And my answer, reason for that is that well, typically those triggers are used just the unemployment rate in a state. And uh, what I've done, I've looked at employment growth during the 16 months prior to the recent uh, pullback that, uh, and also employment, employment growth since the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. And you basically find about half of the U.S. states uh, where you have either high unemployment, mm -hmm. but you have uh, low job creation. So, you know, I, I read that research. I've contributed to that research on you know, high unemployment benefits, uh, detract and, and reduce the incentive to work. But when you don't have jobs opportunities, you know, it becomes so very difficult. So, in other words, start, start now it. is a very different situation. We're living in a, in a unique, very challenging challenging economic time and the reality is we just aren't seeing enough jobs being created. If you were to suddenly pull the plug and say no more unemployment benefits, what might that do to our economy? Why does that scare sure. you? Sure. Well, there's the micro micro effect and that's at the individual family Absolutely. level. These families the are, are pulling pulling back and uh, you're also going to see greater uh, emphasis or need of, uh, of United Way and other social so social service uh, nonprofits to help with people. But what about the macro level? At the macro level, well, there's been evidence to show too for, you know, for every dollar of UI benefit that goes into a community, you know, you're generating over a dollar of economic activity. So right. there is this, and, and in this, again, this period right now where we're seeing the broader stimulus that has been uh, implemented waning, uh -huh. uh, you're just pulling back on another key form of stimulus you that, know, that Dan, helps families and also local communities. I know you disagree with this. Tell <laughs> us why. Well, I don't have to tell you why. I can just quote uh, left-wing economists like Larry Summers and Paul Krugman. It makes sense when you think about it. If you pay people to be unemployed, they're more likely to be unemployed. And it's not because they're slackers or trying to game the system, although I have a couple of buddies from college who did that. The main problem is that when you give people unemployment benefits for a long period of time, they hold out what's called a reservation wage. Well, I'm not going to take a job unless I get at least this much, uh, mm -hmm. whereas if they didn't have the... Uh, the, uh, the comfort of the unemployment benefits, they might take a lower wage. But as the report that you showed, uh, I, I thought was very insightful. It talked about the problems of people being out of the labor force for six months, 12 months, 18 months. They, in effect, become much harder to employ. So, so government uh, is like loving them to death. It's putting them in a very difficult position. Uh, and yes, we, uh, both of us agree mm -hmm. that it's a tragedy, that we're not creating more jobs. But here's where I think the problem is. All the overspending, overtaxing, and overregulation from Washington, we're becoming more like a European welfare state, so we shouldn't be surprised we're seeing the kind of weak job situation that you normally find in Europe. And that's what we need to fix as soon as possible. But you know, let I, me just ask you real quick. Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, but I, I, you know, I always hear the conversations want to be tilted to issues around, you know, we're overtaxing or issues around overregulation, but I only always hear the evidence. I mean, I think, you know, the economic indicators, the headwinds that today, the GD, a slower GDP growth uh, estimate, uh, uncertainty in China, un a slower a slower growth in China, uncertainty in the EU, and the broader uh, and the broader sort of OECD economies, that is, I think, much, much stronger evidence to support, you know, a, a, an absence of job creation as opposed to, again, we're overtaxing and we're, and we're, over we're burdening, uh, burdening employers. Dan? Oh, there's no question that those are factors as well. I think we probably would agree on maybe 80% of these things. But if you want evidence, look at, over the long run, 
the job creation numbers, the employment data from the European Union, especially the high-tax European nations, and compare that to what historically we've had. Uh, you know, not just I'm not you know just picking out Republicans, but we had obviously good job numbers during Reagan, but we also had good job numbers during Clinton when the burden of government was falling. Whereas under Bush and Obama, a Republican and a Democrat, I think the numbers have been fairly weak. But I think that's because both Bush and Obama. Increase the burden of government. And mm -hmm. let's be honest, why do businesses create jobs? Because they think that those employees will help them make money. But if government is just putting one roadblock after another in the way of job creation and the way of profitability, that's what gets me concerned about the uh, about not only out, the outlook in the short run, mm -hmm. but where we're going to be in the medium and long run. Well, Mike Holland is here with us as well. He's our guest host today. And I'm curious, Mike, do you think at the end of the day, though, Americans especially, we're self-sufficient. It is our instinct to take care of ourselves, to take care of our families. And perhaps when push comes to shove and there's no other alternative, Alternative, people might do whatever it is they have to do, even if that means taking a lower paying job temporarily, but at least perhaps it gets them back in the workforce and back to work, therefore helping the economy. What's your take? Where do you come out on this? First of all, I think they're both right. <laughs> Second of all, we got a politician what, here. Well, well, no, what, 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 I don't say that. <laughs> well, yeah, on one hand, on the other, yeah. I think you're absolutely right, Trish. I, I think that that, and we all have personal experience with people we know who've been out of work for a long time, and there are some of those people who would take the first job that came along. There are others who would, I don't, I agree with the comment that they're not gaming the system, but they have less incentive to take something until the right job comes along. This is a, an incredibly, I've never seen anything as tough as this in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, I think that your, your premise, however, is correct. That if someone doesn't have any way to, we're, we're, we will take a job. We'll figure out what, what way to get some money. We'll, when push oh. comes to shove. But Dan, back to you for a second. I, I just want to play devil's advocate and, and throw one thing into this equation, and that's that we have enormous problems still within the housing sector. And a lot of people have been tied to a particular community or a particular state because they need to make their mortgage payments every month. And so they don't necessarily have the same flexibility uh, to go and take whatever job is out there because they need to pay the bank every month. How is housing affecting the employment equation? Well, to some extent, people are just walking away from their homes because they're underwater and they're moving to low-tax states like Texas, where job creation is a lot stronger. But I also agree with my other guest. I mean, this is one of the headwinds that is there. We do have some challenges. I mean, every time we have an economic downturn, there are different discrete challenges that, that we look at. Uh, so obviously, the sooner we can get the overall economy growing faster, that's really, that's the magic potion that we need to start uh, uh, imbibing because if we get three to four percent or even five percent growth that we normally experience coming out of an economic downturn, a lot of these problems go away. And my frustration, though, with Obama is that instead of changing the Bush policies of more spending and more regulation, he's just stepped on the accelerator and is going in the same direction of bigger government. And I think that's why we have a weak national economy. Okay, but final word here to, to Bill Rogers. Um, if you take away all those unemployment benefits and you leave people suddenly with nothing, don't you run the risk? that you're going to only contribute to the problem uh, in terms of the social welfare system, in terms of the tax burden, everyone's going to have to contribute because you, you could have more problems down the road. Well, I mean, it depends on what kind of, what, to me, it, I view this as what kind of budget do you want to balance? Do you want to balance just a budget in the near term uh, or do you want to also bud balance a budget in the longer term? And if you take a long view, which I think my, your colleague, my, our, our colleague here is wanting to, we also need to make sure that we're including the, the long long-term costs when you cut back on public sector workers who are teachers uh, and you're investing in education and creating larger class sizes. You need to take into account the fact that now you're going to see greater uh, clinical depression in communities because you know, you've cut back on benefits uh, that, uh, that people were utilizing to survive. You need mm -hmm. to take into account the fact that you know, United Way and other social support agencies uh, which have been hit, hit really hard in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the increased demand for their services and that uh, you know they are they are now having difficulty uh, prov providing uh, for Americans and their families. So you know the bottom line here is just that you know we have to have a broader conversation and that yes you know I'm all for capitalism I'm all for you know <clears throat> taking risk.
risk, mm. but we need to have, make sure we're, we're sort of smoothing the edges out uh, in terms of the tough parts of, uh, of capitalism. All right, well, we're going to hope that but jobs number looks a little better tomorrow, but uh, it, it's, it's been tough going. I, unfortunately, we got to leave it there. Bill Rogers, former chief economist with the U.S. Department of Labor and Cato Institute senior fellow Daniel Mitchell, and a special thanks to you, Mike Holland. <laughs> The politician coming out on both sides here of this debate. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank Some you, really interesting insight on the economy and how to invest in this very treacherous time from Mike Holland of Holland & Company.